Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Heaven Sensky. I'm the organizing director with the Center for Coalfield Justice. I am also a graduate of Camp McMillan High School, um, and so this community is very important to me. I still live here, um, and I'm really happy to see you all here tonight. So just so everybody knows, we have over 60 people joining in virtually tonight, and we had 150 people register for tonight's meeting. There's been a lot of changes in the last week, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we're really going to try, focus, try to stay focused on public health impacts in our communities and not any contention around that. So I am formerly the co-chair of the External Advisory Board for the Pitt Health and Environment Studies. Some of you may have gotten a call or seen something in the news uh, that Pitt and the Department of Health were supposed to be here tonight, and that's accurate. I was working very closely with them since April to hold this public forum to answer questions from community members. Um, as it was community members that demanded these studies take place in the beginning, and I was invited to join the advisory board because of my connection to community members and to maintain credibility of the study by connecting the impacted community. Um, Pitt pulled out of the study last Wednesday, and the Department of Health followed. We have reason to believe that Pitt and the Department of Health were pressured by industry. We know that they are repped on their board of trustees. We are gathering information around that, and when we have it, we will share it with all of you widely. But I want to make sure that we stay focused on the content tonight, which is public health in Recording our community. Recording in progress. And not any contention around it, right? This is not contentious. This is about our children and our families and public health in our communities. So we have some general ground rules for tonight. So this is a really emotional topic, and I'm going to step back here so you all can see the screen. There are families here tonight who have been directly impacted by rare childhood cancers, regardless of your opinion on industry or whatever is going on in the community. We need to respect that and that people have a right to ask questions and be concerned. In addition to that, we're going to ask general stuff, right? Silence your phones, respect people's questions, no shouting. We're going to open the floor for questions at the end. Um, and we need to be respectful, right? If it gets to a point to where we need to ask somebody, we're going to give you a warning. If you're yelling or being unreasonable, we will ask you to leave. Um, I know some of you may have seen the borough police here. They, they are here um, and on call for this event. We know that this is a contentious issue, but we don't expect to have any issues tonight. Um, we're going to take comments at the end of the presentation, and some of you who registered may have seen that we gave you the opportunity just to make comments ahead of time. We have those here tonight, questions. We just wanted to prepare the best we could. We were working with the Department of Health and Pitt to answer those questions, and of course they pulled out of the meeting. So, that being said, there are several former advisory board members on this panel here tonight that are here to answer your questions. What we cannot answer, we are going to have you direct to the Department of Health and or Pitt, and we will give you contact information for those institutions at the end of the event, okay? All right, everybody good on the ground rules. Thumbs up. All right, I'm going to have a seat. These folks here are going to go around and introduce themselves. They all have great roles in the community, and their organizations are here representing a variety of issues. And they're all really great, so bear with them. And again, bear with us all. This is a hybrid model. We haven't done this before. And we're all kind of scrambling to get you the information you all deserve because we were depending on several institutions to be here tonight that are not here. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Mackenzie White. I'm the Public Health Manager for the Environmental Health Project. I think we'll just start with introductions and then we'll get into our presentations. Hi, I'm uh, Laura Dagley. I'm a nurse and the Medical Advocacy Coordinator for Physicians for Social Responsibility uh, Pennsylvania and a former um, external, external Advisory Board member. Um, my name is Erica Jackson. I'm uh, the manager of community outreach and support for Frack Tracker Alliance and a former external advisory board member. My name is Ned Katire. I'm a retired pediatrician. Uh, I am a medical advisor for Environmental Health Project at the table right over there. Um, I'm president of Physicians for Social Responsibility Pennsylvania. We have a table right over there. Hope you visit. <laughs> Um, uh, as a, a pediatrician, um, 
I can tell you that uh, for every one of you, parent and grandparents sitting here, there are hundreds of other parents and grandparents who are not here with us today uh, in this community who are equally concerned uh, about what's happening uh, with fracking and the health of their themselves and the health of their uh, families. Okay, so I think I can just uh, jump in. Um, I'm going to be giving you a little bit of background on the studies. Um, we don't have results to share, but hopefully the information that I do share will help you um, understand the results when they're ready. A little bit more background about me. Um, I've been with Frack Tracker for about four years, um, and with a lot of my work focusing on oil and gas impacts in this part of the country. Before that, I was a research fellow at the University of Pittsburgh, um, doing research on air pollution, health impacts from different industrial sources, including fracking, and uh, my degree is also from the University of Pittsburgh in environmental studies. Um, but just to reiterate, I do not represent the University of Pittsburgh. I was, was not a member of the research I'm not a member of the research team, so I cannot speak for them, um, and I may not be able to answer all your questions, but um, I can direct you to, to the people who can. Okay, so I recognize there is a lot of expertise on this issue already in the room here tonight. Um, and again, I want to thank you for showing up because I know a lot of time and energy and emotion has been put into understanding how our environment is impacting us and our families. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, so news broke on um, just a, a bit of background in case you're not familiar, news um, broke on the alarming number of cancer cases in southwestern Pennsylvania, particularly at the Cannon McMillan School District in 2019. Um, David Templeton and Don Hopi uh, published an investigative series, The Human Toll, on this, which was pretty alarming to a lot of us. Um, there was a community meeting that many of these groups hosted that probably a lot of you attended. Um, in October and followed by um, a meeting hosted by the Department of Health um, on October 10th where they shared uh, the results of a review. Maybe raise your hand if you were at that or, or put it in the chat or something. So a lot of the same people were at that meeting. Um, they shared that there were um, no conclusive findings of a cancer cluster in the Cannon McMillan School District in Washington County. I know that meeting, let, um, that review was really limited and it left a lot of us kind of frustrated by some of those limitations in the narrow scope and we really wanted researchers to look at what is actually in the environment and we wanted them to look at fracking, an industry that has really exploded over the past 15 years, um, you know, while this generation of children were being raised. Um, so, uh, many of you, families of cancer patients, um, went to Harrisburg and confronted Governor Wolf, and I was there, and it was really powerful, and it was successful, and you got this research, um, and that's a huge win, and that's why we're here today. Next slide, Stacey. And uh, so then, by the, it took another year, but at the end of uh, 2020, Pitt announced, uh, Department of Health announced that Pitt was conducting that research. Um, and then the research began. So where we are today is that the data has been collected, the results are being analyzed, the survey portion um, is complete, and uh, we know that Pitt is due to give the Department of Health an update on the, uh, on the findings November 15th, and many of the groups in, at this, uh, hosting this meeting have been meeting regularly with the Department of Health, um, and we're going to keep you updated when we have those updates. All right, so um, I'm going to give a little bit of background on the studies, and this information is available at paenv.pit.edu. So paenv.pitt.edu, and um, I'll be referencing the website just so you know where you can find and and you know get this information um, later. So I'll go over the region that the studies are looking at, the health issues, and the, um, the things in the environment that are being studied. 
And all of these studies are answering the question, are these, are people who are more exposed to fracking and other things in our environment more likely to have these health outcomes? And they're looking at three health outcomes. So cancer, asthma, and um, birth outcomes, things like low birth weight. So it's looking at those links and associations. It's not going to be able to tell us, is fracking causing these things? That might seem like a small distinction, but it's important um, and something to keep in mind. This is not the end all be all of research, but luckily this research is building off a lot of other existing research to kind of further our understanding of this um, issue. So this is the region um, that's being studied. This is where the medical records and uh, families that are surveyed are being pooled from. It's an eight county area. Um, and the city of Pittsburgh is excluded. There's, there's no fracking within Pittsburgh and the exposures are different. Okay, next slide. Um, and once again, back to the website. Uh, if you go to the top of it um, and click cancer study, you can find uh, more information about that. So to get into what health outcomes are being studied, the first one is looking at cancer. Next slide. And this study is answering the question, are people who are more exposed to fracking and other things in the environment more likely to have these cancer outcomes? And the, cancer, uh, the cancers that are being studied are Ewing's uh, bone cancers, childhood leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and central nervous system tumors. And this is looking at those cases in children. Um, with the exception, the Ewing's bone cancers will also look at young adults up to 29 years old. So um, this research, unlike the other studies, is actually using interviews with families to gather more information, like where their parents worked, where the student went to school, um, things like that. And the other studies aren't doing those kinds of surveys. And this research is being done because of the demands of the community and concern that fracking is related to these cancer cases. Um, but we also know that fracking can release chemicals into the environment like benzene that are associated with childhood cancers. So again, building off that knowledge we have. Next slide. Okay, so if you're on the website, um, you can go over to asthma and birth studies to read about the other two. The second one is looking at asthma, asthma attacks. It's, a it's asking the question, are people who are more exposed to fracking and, and things in our environment more likely to have asthma attacks? And it's doing that by looking at medical records of things like hospitalizations for asthma attacks, um, emergency room visits for asthma attacks, and prescriptions for asthma medications. And this research is being done because we know that things in our environment, air pollution, specifically particulate matter, those little tiny particles that we can inhale, um, are associated with asthma, and we know that fracking is cause, causes that kind of air pollution. Okay, next one. The third and final study is looking at birth outcomes. So there's four of them. The first one is birth weight among term infants, babies born at 37 weeks, uh, preterm birth, those born before 37 weeks, small for gestational age, so infants that are born smaller than infants born at the same number of weeks. And the fourth one's not on the website, but uh, it's APGAR score, um, a score given to an infant when it's born to you know, um, determine how healthy it is. Um, and this research is asking the question, are people who are pregnant, who are closer to fracking and other things in the environment, more likely to have an infant with one of these um, adverse health outcomes? And this study is being done because, once again, we know things in our environment, air pollution, particulate matter, um, are associated with adverse birth outcomes. And in particular, there's research that shows links between fracking and preterm birth. So it, there's some of the strongest evidence on fracking health impacts is actually on um, infants. 
So all of that is um, on, the, on the website. You can reference it and learn a little bit more. And the last thing I'm going to talk about are what are the things in our environment that are being included. So on the exposure tab, um, you can see a list of all of the data sources. And um, if you go to the next slide, some photos. So the big thing are unconventional or fracked wells. These are um, a, a big focus in the research. And not only how close people are to the wells, but the intensity of the wells, how big they are, what phase of their, of their life are they in. Um, next slide. It's also looking at impoundment ponds. Um, things that store different liquids associated with fracking, very resource intensive. Uh, next slide. Um, it's also looking at sites that accept oil and gas waste. I know this is a huge concern to many of us. Um, this is the Westmoreland Sanitary Landfill. So any site that according to the DEP is accepting oil and gas waste is included. Those could be landfills, but also a lot of it are other well pads where waste is being reused or some kind of centralized treatment plant, um, injection wells, and those are included. Next slide. Uh, compressor stations, those are along pipeline routes to compress gas. They're a big source of air pollution and those are being looked at. Um, conventional wells, we have so many conventional wells in Pennsylvania. Um, and the, some of you know some of the health impacts are a little different than unconventional, but those are also being looked at. This is a map of toxic release inventory sites. These um, so now we're getting into not necessarily oil and gas sites. These are also being looked at in the study. Um, these are sites that are known to make or use some kind of toxic, including carcinogens. I, I took a photo from one near here, um, ATI, but there are a lot in Pennsylvania. And Superfund sites. Um, Superfund sites are, are hazardous sites that need to be cleaned up that the EPA tracks, and those will be included. Um, and the uranium disposal site, which I know is a big concern around here, is being included as well. And then there are um, sites with permits to release industrial waste, an NPDES permit, if you want to get technical or a water quality management permit. These are sites that um, have some kind of waste. They release it into a waterway. This is the Ohio River um, or through stormwater runoff. And those who are also being included. Um, this is the BASF plant in Manaka near the Shell Ethane Cracker, which also has this kind of permit. Uh, okay, if you can go back, no worries, uh, I forgot. So those are the exposures that are being included and one more important thing is they're also using air quality data from satellite imagery um, that looks at particulate matter. I think I mentioned that earlier um, and so that's a, a good way to um, get more information on the air quality in this region and that is historical. Um, so that is a little bit of background on what the studies are looking at. I hope that was helpful to you all. Um, and if you want to learn more about where these sites are in your community, you can find me afterwards. Um, that Frack Tracker does a lot of mapping around all of these things. So um, I'll hand it over to Mackenzie and Laura. Thanks, everybody, and thank you, Erica. Uh, Laura and I are going to talk a little bit more about health impacts and what we already know from other studies um, and research in general. So just to start off, 
Um, we have this great graphic, thanks to CCJ. Um, so I just like to start off reminding everyone, you know, there's a lot of different phases within shale gas development. We're not just talking about the well pad or the drilling itself. Like Erica mentioned, there's like landfills that are accepting the shale gas waste, um, pipelines, everything included. So just as a reminder, um, this is, as Erica said, a really big issue in Pennsylvania, where we are one of the most heavily fracked states, and out here in Southwest PA, um, Washington County being one of the heaviest fracked areas. So you, thank you. So we're just going to talk a little bit before getting into the health impacts. Um, just looking about you know how they get into our environment first. So. When we're talking about different chemicals or toxic substances that get out and in eventually into contact with us, we're looking at how they get into usually the soil, the water, or the air. Um, there's different ways that this can happen, but for soil, we're usually looking at things like wastewater releases, um, other things like venting or flaring that occurred, could occur at any of these facilities. For water, we're talking about different things. Erica showed the picture of the impoundment um, pond. So there's a lot of water we know that's used during the fracking process. So water could be inadvertently released, whether it's through a spill or a leak, um, during the actual drilling of a well with the water that comes back up, um, as well as in the transport of this wastewater afterwards. So when it's being transported to um, the facility that's going to process it to a landfill all along the way. And then when we talk about air emissions, we're looking at different toxic chemicals that we know could get into the air. As Erica said, like a lot of research, we already know um, that particulate matter has indications of causing issues for people with asthma or breathing issues. So things like that have been found to be released in different parts of the fracking life cycle, um, as well as things like volatile organic compounds, diesel emissions, which we see a lot with like truck traffic, because we know there's more truck traffic around different well pads, as well as things like silica dust. So then we're... So then we're looking at um, once it's in our environment, right? It's in our. Sorry. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So once we have it in the air, or the water, or the soil, right? Then we're looking at how it gets to us. Um, so that could be through inhalation, we're breathing it in through the air, ingestion, um, if it somehow got into the water or onto our crops or things like that and then skin contact as well. It's important to note that symptoms that you may experience could vary based on a bunch of different things, um, such as how long you're being exposed, how often you're being exposed, how toxic the levels all are. All of those things are gonna impact what kind of symptoms you may have. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to talk more. All right, hi. Hello. Okay. So this is my like first in-person presentation, I think in like over three years. So <laughs> um, this feels like a big deal, but um, thank you all. I'm really sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Can we just make sure that we're speaking a little bit louder and yeah. a little bit slower so the folks online are able to understand? Good. Good note. All right. So, um... So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the health impacts um, and public health in general. So we have um, the top 10 symptoms here that are associated with proximity to oil and gas drilling. And these um, are self-reported symptoms um, by people who live within a kilometer of a fracking well site. Um, so they include sleep disruption, headaches, throat irritation, uh, stress and anxiety, cough, shortness of breath. Um, sinus problems, 
fatigue, nausea, and wheezing. And what's important to note is that all of these symptoms that were self-reported um, were not explained by pre-existing conditions. And there are ones that we might expect to see if someone was exposed to known um, contaminants that are emitted during oil and gas drilling. So for example, we know um, that benzene is a component of oil and gas activities, and we also know that benzene can cause headaches and nose and throat irritation and fatigue. So um, this leads to uh, the concept of biological plausibility. And this is basically just a really fancy way to say that what we're seeing makes sense. Um, the health impacts that are reported are what you would expect to see if someone was exposed to certain chemicals. Um, and these chemicals are generated by oil and gas activities, like the example of benzene. Um, so why you, while you can't necessarily say that there is like a direct link between the two, um, it is likely uh, the cause of these symptoms because based on the previous science and research that we have. Um, Evidence-based methods in medicine and other health-related fields uh, um, have really emphasized... <laughs> Do I keep going when it stops? Or? All right. So um, all this to say that biological plausibility is actually really important um, when it comes to medicine and evidence-based practices. Um, it's important decision-making with public health um, because a lot of our evidence is coming from observational studies rather than controlled studies. And so that leads me to talk about uh, correlation versus causation. Um, you know, when it comes to environmental health, um, uh, and like in a lot of other fields of study, you're going to hear that uh, you need to prove causation and that correlation um, is not as important. But when it comes to environmental health, um, it's not always the case because with environmental exposures, it's almost impossible to prove causation um, due to ethics and just the um, inability to control all the factors. We can't take two babies and put one by a fracking well pad and one away from it and see how they turn out ethically. We just can't do that. So in the world of environmental health, proving uh, uh, or showing correlation is actually um, pretty important. Um, just showing that a connection between things um, carries more weight than it would in other fields of research. But, um, so in any field, uh, continued research um, is important and necessary, um, but we don't want to look at just one study and, and have that one study inform all the decisions that we're making in public health. We really need to look at studies as a whole and the trends in the research. And so when I'm talking about trends, I like to bring up um, the compendium that Physicians for Social Responsibility um, helped create with Concerned Health Professionals of New York because it, it uh, summarizes a lot of the reports and studies that are out there. And when you look at all the studies as a whole, it shows that 90% of the research um, at, on health impacts are showing harm or a potential for harm from fracking. Um, and that's a pretty big deal. So again, one study um, may not show health impacts, but when 90% of the research is showing um, health impacts, then that's something we need to listen to and pay attention to. Um, many of the studies and investigations were actually conducted here in Pennsylvania, um, and they show correlations, um, not causation, but correlations between living and working close to fracking operations and health damage. And this is um, the eighth edition that just came out this past year. So there's been, over the past eight years, um, a growing um, body of research um, contributing to the um, health impacts, physical and mental, um, from living near fracking sites. Next slide. And so we um, want to highlight just a couple of these studies. Again, there's a lot out there, and we don't want to look at just any one study, but we're going to highlight a couple um, that are showing the trends um, and that are also similar to the ones that Pitt is doing. So. For example, in 2016, there was a study looking at asthma. Um, it looked at the records in the Geisinger Health System. So again, similar to the way that Pitt is conducting the study, they're just looking at health records that already exist. And um, this looked at records for over 35,000 asthma patients who needed medical treatment for exacerbation. And exa asthma exacerbations um, are defined as shortness of breath, wheezing, coughing, um, or chest tightness caused from inflammation of the, that restricts airflow to the lungs. And these um, researchers then looked at shale gas development 
activity near the patient's residence um, the day before the patient sought medical treatment. And they found that those with the highest level of exposure to shale gas wells in each phase of production were more likely to experience asthma exacerbations when compared to those with very low exposure. And the strongest associations um, were seen during stimulation and production phases of development, where um, asthma sufferers were three to four times more likely to experience an asthma attack and seek medical care um, than those who didn't live near shale gas development. Um, next slide. And a very recent study in 2021 um, was looking at birth outcomes. Um, researchers looked at the proximity of pregnant mothers um, living near oil and gas drilling sites and its impact on low birth weights. Um, this study took place in Texas. And, um, and this is a study where pre previous research and the idea of biological plausibility um, plays an important role in our interpretation of the results. Because we know from outside of oil and gas activity that air pollution um, causes low birth weight um, uh, when pregnant mothers um, are exposed to high air pollution. Um, their babies often have uh, low birth weights. And so now we're also seeing this with um, pregnant mothers who live near oil and gas drilling sites. So again, um, it's the biological plausibility. This makes sense and is consistent um, with the science and previous research. And this study found that infants of mothers living within one kilometer of drilling sites um, at the time of delivery had an average birth weight that was 30 grams lower in comparison to infants born prior to the drilling activity. And so this, again, supports the hypothesis that oil and gas activity um, increases the risk of adverse birth outcomes. And again, this is one in many studies um, that are showing this trend towards poor birth outcomes. And I'm going to hand it over to Mackenzie to talk about the leukemia study. Um, so then the last one we're going to talk about is the leukemia study, which I think a lot of people are familiar about. This is really recent and just came out. Um, in this study, a bunch of researchers at Yale were looking at whether individuals who are living in proximity to shale gas activities um, had an increased odds for developing this specific type of leukemia. So they looked at two different windows of time for individuals, the first being the primary window, which they considered three months before conception of the child up to one year before their diagnosis. And then the second window that they looked at was three months before conception up to birth. Ultimately, the study did find that children living in proximity to shell gas activities had a two to three times odds of developing um, this type of leukemia. As Laura and Erica have talked about environmental studies, um, we're looking, we can't say A caused B specifically. So in this. <laughs> Sorry, batteries. Yeah, okay. Um, so in this study, they're looking at what's odd, what they call as odds risk, which basically means is there an increased odds for someone to develop this type of leukemia? They also looked at, oh sorry, go back one. <laughs> Thank you. They also looked at um, whether water could be a potential exposure pathway. So was contamination getting into people's groundwater and then potentially um, impacting individuals. They did find that those living up gradient had a increased odds for developing ALL, which basically translates to they did find that people who were downstream of um, a frac pad may be more likely to develop this. We know that when you're downstream from something, right, things are going to flow downhill, so you're more likely to get whatever contamination could have been in the water. And this was just, you know, we wanted to take a step back. I know we've talked about a, this a bunch, but this is kind of, I think, one thing to take away. We know that the PIT study results should be out by the end of the year. So going into that, remembering that these are epidemiological studies. And as Laura was talking about, right, we can't 
um, separate one group of people and another group of people. So it is a different type of study in the sense we're not going to see um, the direct causation, but we're looking for correlation. So is there an increased odds for someone to develop something? Um, so it's important to just remember that in preparation for these studies to come out so we know what we're looking at when we interpret those results. So as we mentioned earlier, Pitt and DOH cannot be here tonight, so there are two ways that you can submit questions. Um, if you submitted a question in advance on registration, the Department of Health did send us answers. So I believe, heaven said, we'll be able to send those out to registrants. Um, you can also submit it directly to them. There's this link, the QR code also goes to their website. You can submit comments or questions that they will respond to. And then if there's questions for the PIT team specifically, there's an email there. All right. So all the folks up here are deeply educated on these issues and they're happy to take your questions right at the moment. So does anybody here ready to ask a question? I can ask some of the ones online. Come on in. Oh God, see what you're talking about. The battery's definitely going to die then. <laughs> I, I am going to ask you to use it for online. Alrighty. Alrighty. Hi there. Um, I saw it a couple weeks ago that there was an article in the Post Gazette asking for more <laughs> participants in the control group. And um, I will definitely be asking Pitt this question as well. Uh, it's going to start squeaking. But if for some reason there isn't enough uh, members of the control group, how is this going to affect the study if you can just speculate? what that might happen. It's if this is going to jeopardize the rest of the results, especially with families waiting for even preliminary results. Thank you. If I can just, if I can just, if I can just say, uh, Robin, that's a question that you should present to the state and to uh, Pitt. I think they, they are best handled to uh, answer that question. So one of the questions we received multiple times on the online form was whether or not the uranium site in Sturbain is included as an exposure metric, and the answer is yes. That site is an EPA super fun site, and they regularly monitor it, and we have access to all that data, and it was included in the study. The other thing that's important to note is this study was not limited to the Canna McMillan School District, which in the past, the cancer cluster results that they shared was limited to Canna McMillan. We know that the prevalence of Ewing sarcoma cases are not limited to the Canna McMillan School District. They are centralized in southwestern Pennsylvania as a whole. Specifically, Washington and Westmoreland counties have the highest numbers. So I know everybody is concerned about the uranium site. It's not great. I totally understand. I have family that have generations in Strabane, they all died from cancer. This is not the same, this is different. These correlations are not related to the uranium site. Did any uh, monies for this research come from NIH at all? No? The funding for this study is uh, is taxpayer funded from Pennsylvania taxpayers. Okay, sorry, I will read you exactly what the Department of Health sent, which was, the governor included 2.5 million in funding for the Department of Health to work with research partner in the state fiscal year 2020 to 2021 in the executive budget. So the funding was agreed to by the General Assembly and included in the signed state budget that year. I work in, uh, I work for Pitt in research and um, we're, I work on the ECHO studies, if you know what that is. You're a pediatrician, she, okay. But they're all funded by the NIH. And we, the national ECHO program is studying environmental impacts. So that's why I'm interested in that, because um, the study may conclude in 2023. So this is going to give them information, because they'll pull onto this.
Hi, um, I just want to say, um, so I, I have something to read, a little, a short little thing here, but it, um, fracking waste is toxic and it should be handled as such to, pr to protect public health. It contains radium-226 and 228, which are present in shale. Radium-226 is an alpha emitter, water soluble, and a serious health risk if ingested or inhaled, often as dust. Once ingested or inhaled, radium is treated by the body as if it were calcium and stored in the bones. So I, I want to also say that Ewing sarcoma is a rare um, bone cancer, uh, a bone cancer that took my son. So isn't it quite possible, or extremely possible, that that's what's going on? And don't we want to know about it? Don't we want to understand this and find the truth? And we all need to gather together and rally until we do get the truth. And the fact that these, that the DOH and, the, and Pitt, which we are part of that study, is not here tonight, is a true indication that we are in this alone and that we better rally together and get it done. You're not in this alone, Janice. But what, what I do want to say too is that this isn't the beginning or the end of environmental studies on public health impacts in our communities. And that's what's really important to take away from here today. This isn't the only study. This isn't gonna be the last study. And we have to keep building information to advocate for ourselves. Does anyone else have another question? Sure. I just wanted to add that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, for every one of you, parents and grandparents, that are here tonight, and there are a lot of you here tonight, but I will tell you there are a hundred, there might be hundreds for every one of you of parents and grandparents in these communities where the fracking is happening that are extremely concerned about what's happening. So um, you're not alone. There are a lot of people that are concerned. There are a lot of physicians that are concerned. Uh, there are a few uh, elected officials that are concerned. Um, people are concerned. Nobody should be surprised that people are getting sick when they're exposed to fracking operations. Did they write it or did they want to speak? They, they, they type it out. Did you want to read it off? I'm sorry. Uh, that one, go ahead and scroll up. And yes, it is the orange thing. All right, so the question online is, is the contract between the state of Pennsylvania and the grantee, i.e. Pitt Health and PADOH, or the statements of work for the projects in the public domain? The contract is held by the Department of Health, and anybody who wants it can file a right to know to get it, or I would be happy to share it with you. Are the townships that use brine road spreading techniques in southwestern Pennsylvania included in areas of concern with the study? Erica, can you answer that? Um, if it's, so, um, if a company is using is taking their waste and then spreading it on the road, they should report that to the DEP, and that should show up in the database that they're using. It would show up as a place receiving waste, beneficial reuse. Um, I know there are concerns around that happening illegally, and um, you know that wouldn't be captured, but. If, if a company were doing that, then it, it should be in the data and be included. So the data included in the study is self-reported data from the industry. That's all we have access to. Oh. Okay, the folks online can't hear you. Oh. Sorry. Are the field employees of the oil and gas companies included at all? Since they're out there in the field and probably inhaling and Um, so the asthma study is looking at people of all ages, I believe. I'm double checking like my notes right now. I think it's like five to 90. Um, 
So if they were an asthma patient, they would show up in the records, um, but I, it's not probably capturing, it, this study is not looking specifically on workers. Um, for the cancer study, it, the, the portion that includes surveys, um, the survey asks about workplace exposure, um, but largely it, this isn't focused on workers, but yes, workers are exposed and, and that's an important area of research. Can one of you quickly speak to why we may be seeing impacts in children now rather than grown adults? Uh, children are not little adults. Children are uniquely susceptible uh, to uh, breathing and ingesting uh, pollutants, uh, air pollution, uh, pollution in water, uh, chemical pollution. Uh, they breathe more per unit body weight, they drink more water than per, than, per unit body weight than adults do, they eat more food per unit body weight than adults do. Um, and their immune systems uh, are uh, not as mature, uh, so they react differently when they're exposed to chemical toxics in the environment. Uh, the other thing about kids is that they, they will expose themselves more. They play more outside. They play uh, in the dirt and the grass where pollution settles. Uh, every parent knows that uh, kids put everything in their mouths, rocks, toys, fingers and hands. And, and so their exposure is going to be uh, greater. And the last thing is that uh, children have a longer shelf life than adults do. What I mean by that is that um, it takes, uh, it can be uh, decades before they develop symptoms after exposure. You know, I'm 62 years old. If I'm exposed to something, you know, maybe I'll get cancer in 20 years. But kids have a whole lifetime after exposure uh, to develop symptoms of disease and, and really suffer from them. Uh, so, um, you know, there is a latency period uh, in cancer. Uh, cancer in children is, is, is different than cancer in adults, and we look at it differently. Uh, but uh, the shelf life is really, really important to keep in mind. We still don't know the extent of cancer risk from fracking. and we're, It's only been going on, at least in Pennsylvania, for what, 15, 18 years, uh, and really just has exploded over the past 10 to 12 years. So. There's a latency period, and we still we still don't know truly uh, what is in store for all of us uh, when we're um, surrounded by fracking operations in our communities. This is more just a comment to what Dr. Katire said and what the previous person asked watching my four children being younger and having more severe health impacts and then as they age, now I worry when is the latency period for them. Um, you know, specifically my third son was like a canary in the coal mine from, I mean, nosebleed so bad that he was turning pale and was anemic and rashes and, you know, throughout and, and correlating this with fracking and, and my two older sons at the time had impacts but not as bad as my younger ones. So just to again reiterate what Dr. Katara was saying about as they're growing, like they're not little adults. And now that they're a tiny bit older, I don't see as much with them. Probably because again of their, as you said, their immune systems and stuff. But it was just, as you said that, it just clicked in my head. Well, that's, that's why. So, but I do still constantly worry about, well, when is the latency period for the four of them? Sorry. Um, my name is Jody Borello. I live in South Franklin Township. I testified at two grand juries, once against the Department of Environmental Protection and one time against CNX Resources, who did receive criminal charges for what they did in my township. This is a picture of my beautiful son, Nico. We were exposed to an unknown substance coming out of a
this substance, I was told by the DEP, was, quote, everything that is being pumped into the well pad is coming out of this unpermitted pipe. It would shoot 40 feet up in the air and blow into my property. This substance trespassed on my property. We had rashes, nosebleeds, and we were sick for nearly a decade. CNX did this seven days a week, three times a day, including holidays, for nearly a decade. And they did not apologize to my children, they did not apologize to my community, and they should be ashamed of what they've done. My family is terrified of the repercussions of what could happen to us in the next several years. There is cancer on my road, including brain tumors, which I am shocked is not included in this study, and I would like to know why brain tumors were not included in this study. We have three in our community, um, and that does not include the other cancers on our road. So I also would like to know how Pitt decided who they were gonna include in this study. I don't believe anyone on my road was included, and I know I wasn't welcomed into that study, and I would like to know why. Um, I'm really sorry to hear about all of your family's health issues. Uh, this is a question definitely that we should take directly to Pitt. Um, the cancers that were included, childhood leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and brain, and brain and central nervous system tumors. I don't know if that is what is listed on the website, but that is what is listed on a memo from the external advisory board. So sorry for the confusion there, um, but definitely want to take this question to Pitt. As to why you and your neighbors weren't included, um, you know, I can't answer that. I'm not on the research team, but um, they, in theory, should not, you know, they shouldn't be introducing any kind of bias into who is selected for the case group or who's selected for the control group. I know they use different methods to reach out to people, um, but we'll have to ask Pitt why. <coughs> Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so the ages that they're looking at um, are zero to 19. Um, and then, but the Ewing's family of tumors, they're looking at up to 29 years old, so young adults as well. Um, and that's something we advocated for. Um, I did as, as a member of the advisory board that we knew we were seeing cases of Ewing sarcoma in young adults in the community, which was even more rare than seeing it in children. And we pushed them very hard to increase the age to 29. But in addition to that, what I'm hearing is that we need more research, that the state needs to be conducting more research. So I appreciate that comment. Um, and like I said, we were able to increase the age range for Ewing sarcoma because that's what we were seeing and that's what we pushed for. Um, that happened to be something they moved on. Um, but again, we've been advocating for further research. And by the way, the gentleman who lives near South Point with Ewing sarcoma, I think is 35 years old. Um, but the state should know about him. I have a question about the survey. Any survey is going to miss a lot of people. And sometimes people with a problem are the last ones to step forward to, to describe their situation or to have to be included because they have so much going on they just don't want to be involved. So I'm wondering how the survey was conducted and, and whether that alone will be a flaw in this study. Um, so I would encourage, sorry to like keep going back to the website, but because I'm not a, a research team, um, they publish updates and 
the updates kind of give you a little bit more information onto the nitty gritty things. They used um, different methods, mailers, text, and uh, phone calls. But I know there are limitations in terms of how many times they can reach out to someone um, within the study design. And I do think that this is a question that we should be taking to Pitt. Um, because it, it probably has led to, you know, I mean, yeah, that's a, that is a big limitation, uh, reaching out to people. Um, I can follow up too that they contacted people through the survey with cancer registry data, which we know from the cancer cluster report that they did on Canic Millen is not always necessarily accurate because it depends on where people were treated. Um, and that can be difficult to navigate in masses. I, I just want to point out that every study that's done, especially epidemiologic studies, have limitations. Uh, and there's no such thing as a perfect study, um, but that doesn't mean that the studies are invalid. Um, yes, I, I agree with Heaven that you know, more studies need to be done, but um, well, let's be honest. There are plenty of studies that are out there already. There are dozens of studies already showing associations between exposure and living near fracking and serious health problems, especially in children. You know, we, we talk about low birth weight, we talk about prematurity, you know, little babies. Well, those can have lifelong consequences for those babies and their families. Uh, you know, significant health problems uh, with that type of condition. So, and there are many, many, many more, over 2,000 studies showing harm to, uh, to people, to their health, to their property, to their livestock, to their family pets. Um, to the climate. Uh, there are enough studies for action. Uh, we don't have to wait for any more studies to act, to, to use our common sense and do the right thing. There's a question in the chat I'm going to read off to the panel. Are recently diagnosed with Ewing, such as within the past year and fit within the age range, going to be mentioned within the study, and does it seem that this will be an ongoing and updating study throughout the next couple of years since latency reactions will most likely still be occurring? Um, so Childhood cancer cases diagnosed between ages of 0 to 19 and, or 0 to 29 um, from 2010 through 2019. So 2010 through 2019, so recently diagnosed. Uh, recently diagnosed wouldn't be on the registry. There's a delay. Um, and you can also... Um, the, for the other studies, that information is also um, on the website, but I think it's 20, the babies are 2010 through 2020, and asthma uh, data from 2011 to 2021. Is there a second? Anybody else? How are we on time? <clears throat> So I have two questions. The first question is, um, you know, you had mentioned that the study results are going to be um, put out in November. Um, how will, no, not in November? They're required to report to the Department of Health per the contract by November 15. When the public will see the results, we don't have the answer to that. That will have to be posed to PIT. Okay, so we don't know when the study results are gonna be out, but how will people, be able to get that information when it is available? That's my first question. My second question is, um, are there any elected officials here? Um, people that are with, um, that are local or state elected officials, um, and do they care about our kids? You have one. 
Thank you for coming. Can you speak to how folks can access the results? I mean, we can't really answer that. We don't know. Does this one? Okay, so they should be holding a public meeting. Pitt should hold a public meeting. Um, we'll keep you up to date on that. Okay, I just wanted to make a suggestion as I listen to all these questions and concerns. Um, since Pitt isn't here, they could have answered all these questions. So I think we should inundate them using the QR code or the website with our questions because clearly they should have been here. So I suggest we let them know this. And just so folks understand, the QR code is gonna take you to a survey with the Department of Health. Your questions to Pitt need to go to that email address. And we have a flyer, if you haven't gotten one already, we have one at the table up front. Any questions online? We just had a comment online, um, just thanking all of the participating organizations for the work that we do to support the community with transparency. Any other questions? I have a comment. The temperature has dropped. I think there's some coffee, some coffee over there. If anybody needs to warm up, help yourself. We do have another question online. All right. Speaking of transparency, do you feel the government is being transparent, Ned? You asked the doctor. <laughs> is the government? being transparent. The Pennsylvania government? Does, it, does anyone think yes? I mean, that, that, that's a trick question. No, the governments, the governments aren't transparent. Um, and the Pennsylvania government is not transparent. The, the Pennsylvania government has been complicit in, in everything that, uh, that we're talking about tonight. Uh, complicit. Uh, they've um, They've purposely uh, brought this activity into our communities. Uh, they've uh, purposely avoided reading about these studies, learning about these studies, uh, answering uh, residents' questions about these studies. Um, they've done this on purpose, and it's important that we all uh, remember who they are remember their names, uh, re remember uh, everything about them. Uh, these are not stupid people. Uh, they've allowed this to happen. Um, and uh, they, they, we should remember that. I have a follow-up comment to that uh, from Mountain Watershed Association. Um, just a follow-up comment to that Mountain Watershed Association. Last year, we conducted a health survey throughout our communities. Um, which is within the Yakagani River watershed, Somerset, Westmoreland, Fayette County. But we specifically targeted impacted communities um, like through the Waste Stream Bill in Fayette and Westmoreland County. 3,500 surveys sent out. There was one of the questions on that surveys was, do you have faith in your local government? 98% responded no. I think it's important to remember that we can only get transparency if we demand it together. That's why we're here tonight. Kevin, there's a follow-up comment on that. What would you suggest to change that? How do you see transparency? Uh, how do you see transparency looking? Okay. Like how do you see transparency looking like as qualified professionals and impacted re residents? What do we want? And we are, our groups have been working closely with the Department of Health since this story broke in 2019, and we've made some very clear asks of the department that I think Ned or Laura or Mackenzie can speak to. We meet with them quarterly as concerned residents and professionals. I think what we want first is for uh, people in government to uh, understand our concerns, to listen to our concerns, listen to us, uh, ask questions, learn, 
you know, learning doesn't end in the 12th grade. So they can learn, they can ask questions, um, and, um, and they can grow. Uh, we're all learning, we're all asking questions. All of us in this room continue to grow uh, as, we, as we get older. And, and so transparency is really uh, learning, being humble, and telling the truth. <clears throat> telling the truth. And being sensitive to what people are, are experiencing. They're just close to the... Just be careful when you turn it on. <laughs> I'll just add to what Ned said. I think we need to recognize, right, we talked about environmental studies and how they can't tell us this definitely caused um, what we're experiencing, but just because we don't know for sure doesn't mean um, we can't prove no harm, right? And I think part of transparency is getting our agencies and the Department of Health to switch to that mentality of the precautionary principle and advocating for just because we can't prove that doesn't mean there isn't harm happening. to remember that they might not be able to prove causation with these studies, but they can show harm, right? And it's up to us on choosing caution for the lives of our children rather than going on the side of the unknown benefiting these industries, right? The unknown shouldn't benefit them. Okay, I just wanted to point out that the Facilities that we fear are causing health problems are permitted because of our state agency, because of the DEP. And they come to a community and the elected officials in the community are supposed to look at the applications and decide whether it's right for our community. So that's the first stop. But oftentimes they don't, they just let it proceed and the facilities, whatever it may be, a well pad, a pipeline, whatever, may come because the townships allow it, the county allows it, the state allows it. But at each stop, people have a voice. And you can go to your townships and learn about what's coming, what is here, and voice a concern, voice a health concern, voice any kind of concern. But what the DEP hears is nothing. I've been to the files, to the file rooms, and listened or looked at and talked to the agents, and they say time and time again that when the DEP asks the townships, is anybody concerned? Has anyone voiced a concern? No one has. And so if we're not going to our local elected officials and saying, hey, I think there's something coming or there is something here and I have a concern, that's where we need to hold not only the state but the, the local elected officials accountable for their decisions to allow the, the things to come to our communities. So you do have an ability, you have a voice, and we need to use them. So you do need to go to your local, I know it's a pain in the neck to go, believe me, I, I spent so much time there, but you need to let them know you're there, you need to let them know you're watching, and you need to let them know you voted and you want them to be your voice. And so if you have a concern, raise it, raise it publicly, and let them know. Otherwise, they tell the state that we're all okay with this, and I don't think we're all okay with this, but they don't, the, the state doesn't hear it unless it's through our voices through the townships. Thank you. Any other questions about public health and studies? Testing, testing, that one better? Um, it's kind of a legal question. Should we be filing motions now to protect our rights to see the results of this study, or both of these studies, so they don't get squashed by the government and the school? I mean, I, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know all the ins and outs, but it seems like, I mean, there's, is there a precedent now in other states where studies have been done and the results never come out? I, I think I think the uh, results are going to come out. Um, I, you know, 
I do want to say that the research team at Pitt is very good and they're very highly regarded um, and uh, they know what they're doing. It doesn't mean that there are going to be results uh, that there are going to be results that um, you know are earth shaking, uh, but they're they're a competent group, and their intention I know is to do the science and to present the science. And there's nothing that would prevent the University of Pittsburgh, a, a, a research university known internationally as a research in, uh, university, to quash the uh, the results. I, I I don't I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I think that the um, uh, the, the science will be heard, uh, and some people will agree with it. Everyone's going to look at the limitations. It's the first place people are going to look at the limitations. Uh, no study is perfect. Um, and yes, we, we learn from our studies, and then the next study tries to deal with those limitations and limit those limitations, but then there are going to be other limitations. Now, I, I do think the study is going to come out when the study comes out, when it's ready, when it's written, uh, when it's peer-reviewed. Uh, that's the way science works, and um, and we'll know about it. Uh, I would imagine, hopefully, by the end of the year or early next year. I just wanted to say that I know we're all like waiting for the results of the study, and it is a very important study. But to, re regardless of the results, to just remember, there is a lot of. Um, research that is already out there, like Mackenzie and I talked about, um, that is showing health impacts. And you know, a lot of you all live here. You're experiencing the health impacts. You've seen it firsthand. So, don't let um, you know the researchers or the government or anybody like try and gaslight you into thinking that there's not um, health impacts from this industry because you're you're experiencing it. You're seeing it, and there is research to back up um, that firsthand experience. So, I just want to remind everybody of that as we wait for these results. Sounds like what we may need to do is to have a second um, a round of, you know, is somebody keeping it's two questions? One is, are we creating a draft of what we need a follow-on study to look like? Like, what are these other questions that we're all compiling? And I suppose that's what emailing these questions are. So that's that's one piece. And two, what are tasks that and actions that we can do like my kids were not included they have their own you know health issues um, what can I do and you know to help save them now I'm, you know all of us right we're in Marcellus now Utica shale is going to be coming and that's even deeper and what comes next so I'm, I'm your support with the action taking, um, but one of the things we are doing is we are listening to all of you. This meeting was very important. That's what we shared with Pitt, that hearing from the community would be very helpful. Um, all of our groups are working on these things, right? Every single day, everyone you see that has spoke here tonight is working diligently on public health suggestions. What do we want the Department of Health to do for us? What do we need from the DEP? And what do we need on the local level? And that's where folks like me come in, that's organizing, right? So I want to invite everyone to attend a webinar with us on October 25th, which is going to talk about mitigation in your home, what you can do right now to protect your family, and how you can take action to advocate for better practices, because why not? Can I just add, we're not the only ones uh, waiting for the results of this study. Uh, believe me, there are people not just in Pennsylvania, not just in the United States, but all around the world that know about what's happening here. They know about the cancer crisis in southwestern Pennsylvania. They're watching. They're going to look at the study on the, the minute that it's out, and they're going to have their comments and their criticisms and their praises and their ideas about future studies. Going on. Going off of that, I'm going to give the mic to Stacy here. She's an organizer with Mount Watershed Association, and she can tell you a little bit about the sampling program we're running. So if you do live near activity and you're interested in 
sampling around your home, we can support that. We're supporting placing air monitors for folks, specifically in Union Township right now in Washington County, where we know they're building a very large well pad and we're helping people get baselines so that they can fight back as, as things start to show up on those monitors. And, and we're here, we're in your communities. I'm going to township meetings. I'm helping folks understand the changes in their ordinances. We're working collectively, right, to help each other. Um, and that's why we wanted you all to come out tonight too, is to, is to see that there's concern in the community. And that's what we're trying to show the Department of Health and the Department of Environmental Protection. Because uh, Kat over here is right. We hear very often that the departments regularly say, nobody told us, nobody complained. Does anybody here know how to contact the Department of Health with an oil and gas complaint? A couple of us, we're, 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 we're a picked crowd, but most people don't. Most people don't know where to access those resources and, and that's what we're trying to elevate. Thanks so much, Heaven. Um, for those of you who are unsure about how to file a complaint, um, we have several tables of resources um, over to your right. For those who are joining online, we will follow up and email you with all of these resources that you could keep on hand. We do have a document that outlines how you can file a complaint. Um, myself, uh, James Cato is another organizer with Mountain Watershed. Heaven, and I think any of us would be also be willing to guide you through the process. I know Protect PT um, is here in the house and many others, and we, we're here to guide you um, and help you with those resources so you could file complaints. Heaven mentioned a sampling program. One of the primary tools that we use as organizations who support you all, our very own communities, um, is we work to monitor the outfalls of these facilities through air monitoring, as Heaven mentioned, water sampling, as well as through soil and sediment sampling. Um, so Mountain Watershed, we conduct uh, radiation sampling in which we can come to your home and take about 20 to 30 minutes um, to take a teaspoon to four teaspoons of dirt, send it off to a research lab um, so they can get a first run of analysis um, to help us detect what could be outfalling from these facilities into our homes, onto our properties, what we're coming into contact with every single day. Um, again, Mountain Watershed, we have a table, we have a sign-up sheet. You can talk to James or myself post-meeting to learn more about that. We brought our little tools that we use. You could check those out. Um, you could sign up and we can schedule a date to come out to your home. It's completely free um, and we do follow up with results. When we do um, detect that there is a concern, um, we do file complaints and we run it through the ranks to get the concerns addressed. And I just, can you hear me? Okay, I just wanna add as well, um, in terms of filing complaints, EHP has a table as well over there with resources. There's business cards that we have that have all the three main ways you can file a report. Um, so you can stick it in your wallet um, you know, like Heaven said, when we meet with these agencies and they say no one's reporting anything, no one's reporting anything, there's an email there for the Department of Health. Email them every single time. Just keep emailing them. They, it goes on the record. They have to publicly show those reports every quarter. Um, I know it's a pain, but the more we can report things, the better. And EHP, as well as all of our organizations, have more resources available for everyone to check out after. All right, with that being said, given the temperature drop, and um, I'm sure you're all stewing over a lot of information right now, and we understand that, we're going to close the program. We invite you to attend our webinar on October 25th, where you can learn very clear steps to take action and how to protect your families. And whatever updates we continue to get, including why Pitt and DOH are not here, we will make transparent to you all as soon as we have that information.